When you consider the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, we need to think about the word conversion just for a moment. That means a complete change in that man's way of thinking and his life. Thus, in being baptized into Christ, he actually changed states from a lost state, alienated from God and without God in the world, to a saved state, sins remitted, a new creature in Christ, member of the Lord's church. But when you think of what he had to put behind him, it gets rather amazing at what went on in his mind for him to be able to do that. He fully believed in opposing Christ and persecuting Christians that he was doing God's will. And he was as zealous about that as he was once he was converted in preaching the gospel, being an apostle. Now, in the process of persecuting the church, he was the one that gave his approval, held the clothes of those that stoned the first Christian martyr, Stephen. Now, think of what he had to put behind him in his own mind. There are multitudes of people today, to one extent or the other, mentally and even emotionally, and they are different, that have so much trouble in turning loose of the past. Even when they know the truth of God relative to how God forgives sins, and they know that they've obeyed the gospel from the heart, Romans 6, 17, and 18, being then made free from sin. That means God has forgiven their sins. That means that God will remember those sins against them no more. They'll never be brought up again. But we have to deal with that. Simply because we're converted to Christ and all that the New Testament teaches about being converted to Christ doesn't mean just a snap of the finger and we can handle it all. Because many people have done some horrendous things, some far more than others, of course, that when they heard and understood the gospel and obeyed it, there was a lot in their past. They had a lot of baggage they had to deal with in their past. And much is said in the New Testament about forgetting those things. Now, you're never going to forget them from the standpoint of saying, I don't remember that anymore. But it means the power you have, God's given you in being a human being, not to hold them against you anymore. If God does not hold them against you anymore, why do you? Now, it's good to remember things if they motivate you to grow closer to the Lord in the study of His Word and the carrying out of His will. Think just for a moment. A person, let's say, let's say a teenager, maybe steals, and this would be mild nowadays for what, what a lot of teenagers get themselves into, but say a teenager steals a canned Dr. Pepper or something. Well, that's theft. That's taking something that does not belong to you, and you knew it, and you took it. Well, I think that's a sin. It's a transgression of God's law. People are not to steal. But then here's another teenager who takes a life, who commits murder. Now, as far as those two people are concerned, in that they committed sin, either one of them separates them from God. Which one of them do you think is going to have being truly converted to Christ? Which one of them do you think is going to have a harder time dealing with his past? The one who stole the Dr. Pepper, let's say, since I like Dr. Pepper and never get to drink it anymore. Or the one who committed murder. We need to think about those things when we're working with one another, especially those who are converted from this present wicked world and just how quickly they can get embedded in evil and come from families of evil if they're families at all and how that has really shaped them and hurt them. 
And people can live a long time in sin and do a great many things. But I don't know of a sin that God will not forgive and hold them against the person no more. Do you? It doesn't exist. When a person is willing to accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God, believe in Him with such a faith that they obey the Lord in repenting of their sins. That is in their mind, whatever's gone before, they repent of that's contrary to God's will, of course, Acts 17.30. Confessing their faith in Christ, they're now baptized into Christ by His authority to obtain God's forgiveness. Remember that all sin ultimately, though it may involve other people, is against God. He does the forgiving. And thus when we obey the gospel, God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16, God forgives us. But do we forgive ourselves? So in our victory over sin, I don't think there is more important a struggle, some more so than others, that we face today than that of overcoming our past. I can tell you someone who will not let you if he can, who will not let you give up the past and they will be glad to have you remember every wicked thing you ever did if it'll worry you to death as it used to say drive you into an early grave and that's the devil why should he want you to think that God has forgiven you of his of your sins well he doesn't and one of the ways I think Satan has of disheartening the best Christians there are is to get them to remember the mistakes of yesterday. And they rise up to hinder us today. A person doesn't have to be a, a murderer or something like that. A person doesn't have to be a liar. A person doesn't have to be a junkie. Whatever you can think of. But I can promise you one thing that certain of those sins will mean that you must understand. That if God has forgiven you those sins, they'll be brought up against you no more because you from the heart have obeyed the gospel and being baptized for the remission of your sins. Then you need to understand there are some that may be harder to handle than others. So there's no blessing from heaven, no blessing at all from heaven greater than to know in your mind that your sins and your iniquities God remembers against you no more. And I think one of the greatest and maybe say brightest offers which Christianity has to give us is the full realization that the Lord is merciful, full of mercy toward those who are unrighteousness or unrighteous. Listen to Hebrews 8 and verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's the system of salvation that the gospel of Christ offers. When we come into covenant relationship with God that as I said earlier our sins are blotted out Acts 3.19 when is the last time in your prayers to your heavenly father that you thanked him that he's forgiven you of your sins we don't really exercise thankfulness enough and yet you see that unthankfulness, the unthankful, or being unthankful, is one of the signs of people who forget God. So Paul listed it in Romans chapter 1. We should ever be thankful that God has forgiven us of our sins. In 1750, a fellow by the name of Oliver Goldsmith wrote of, and I quote, 
Memory as a fond deceiver that turns all the past into pain. Well, I, I know how you could write that. And there are people right now throughout this world that are doing their best in some way or the other to not remember the evil, the hurt they've done to other people or to themselves or to their families. Now, they may have started doing that by taking drugs to forget or still, I guess, the favorite drug, although it doesn't get listed as that, is alcohol. That's still the most abused one for people just don't, they, they drink to try to forget. And it destroys them. And yet God has the remedy, the great physician does, has had the remedy all along, how you can do that. People won't come to grips with the fact you need to forgive yourself, but you can't if God doesn't forgive you. Oh, you can tell yourself that, but until you really get forgiveness of sins, that must take place in the mind of God toward you. And you must receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Aristotle, long years ago, one of the great philosophers, quoting a contemporary of his, just bluntly stated, quote, even God cannot change the past. Now think about that for a minute. Well, then how do we deal with the past? Well, it has to be getting things right with God. No other way to deal with the past. Now, I know it's true, for the Bible says so in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 1, that bread cast upon the water will return again. And whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, Galatians 6, 7. Well, the wonderful thing about it is, is that God, our Creator, has the power and the wherewithal to give us a brand new start. For all of our past is not held against us any longer. All sins are forgiven. God holds us as one of His. A child of God. Remember what we read a moment ago? Their sins and their iniquities. Well, I remember no more. Hebrews 8, 12. And then children of God, those who've heard the gospel, those whose sins God has forgiven in being baptized into Christ, Acts 2.38. Rise to Christians, and we've spent a lot of time on this lately in the study of 1 John. In 1 John 1, seven, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sins. One of the things that members of the church aren't thankful enough about is they labor to walk the straight and narrow way of truth and live faithful lives is that your sins are being forgiven all along as you walk the straight and narrow way of light. Well, that's something to rejoice about. When is the last time in praying to God you thanked Him for that very process, that very system, whereby your sins are continued cleansed by the very blood that originally saved you from your sins when you were baptized in Christ. And it continues to wash away our sins as we walk in the light as He is in the light. Mark lived long enough to overcome whatever it was that made Paul not want to take him on that second missionary journey. And it's interesting that the Bible's final references to him are very favorable. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. So there's room, because he was a Christian at the time that he left Paul and Barnabas on their first journey. So there's room to grow and to develop. I don't know of a person that's been a member of the church many years that hasn't grown, has more knowledge of the truth, more insight into life, better able how to deal with things because they're faithful. And what does that mean? Well, faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So they've continued to study and to examine themselves and others in the light of the truth. The more truth you know, the more you live it, the more you can understand, the more you can see, the more you grasp. That's the way it works. But that happens in Christ. When you're in a state of favor, when your past sins are remitted, when you were baptized into Christ, 
and you continue to walk in the light as he is in the light, and the blood continues to cleanse. And even the immoral man who was withdrawn from uh, the church there in Corinth so many years ago, according to 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 3, and 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, repented of sins and returned to the truth. The most, well, I, I don't know what's the most, but it is to me, the most memorable parable of the ones that Jesus gave is the quite thrilling story, I think, of who we call the prodigal son. And you know why? While he did not learn his lesson at home, the lessons were instilled within him. And later, when he came to his senses in the hog pen, that's just what he needed to make him realize what valuable lessons he had been taught. And thus he turned in repentance and he returned to his father. Luke 15 again. Well, there's certainly a land of beginning again. And I think when we preach the gospel to people, we must remind them that you're starting over. After all, when you rise from the watery grave of baptism, you're called a new creature in Christ. Now we must live like it. And that means dealing with the past. It's far better than the so-called fountain of youth or some kind of fantasy magic lamp whereby we get our wishes. Hebrews 10 and verse 20 described it this way. It is the new and living way which hath consecrated, which is consecrated for us. Well, that new and living way comes simply because you receive the truth. You're humble and you're meek and you accept God's way as revealed in the scriptures. You no longer trust in yourself. You don't let other people motivate you, but Jesus Christ of the gospel delivers you. It's the only way that will work. There is a poem that expresses this. And I think it says a lot about a whole lot of us, if not all of us, to one extent or the other. And it reads, <clears throat> I wish there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again where all our mistakes and heartaches and all our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never be put on again. Well, there is. Through knowledge and practice of the truth of the gospel of Christ. God doesn't want people to be miserable. The greatest peace anybody can know is peace with God. That cannot come except the person submit to the will of God. And no one correctly submits to the will of God except they receive the truth, accepting it as just that. God's truth, that he knows how to get you from earth to heaven. Nobody else does. So this is an idea that seemingly gets bypassed sometimes. And that, yet we find this that fits, I think, in with it. C.T. Howell had this dedication that's rather challenging. I quote, to all who have regrets for the past, to all who have need for faith in the future. Think about that relative to Christian living. No wonder then we're taught in Romans 8 verse 24, we're saved by hope. Hope takes your mind off of the past. Doesn't mean, as I said in the beginning of this lesson, that you forget everything you did that was wrong. You won't do that. David said, my sins are ever before me. But it means that you know that God has forgiven them. The only reason I can think of, of thinking of sins you may have got into, knowing that God's forgiven them, is that that tells you where your weaknesses are, and you might ought to turn the other way and run from it. And it's good for us, if we're going to grow spiritually, to know what our weaknesses are. You know, everybody is made the same way. But some things appeal to some people more than do other people. 
And some things that allure you to try to, that the devil can use to get you to sin may not necessarily be the same thing that bothers somebody else. So there has to be some intense objective self-examination in the light of what the Bible teaches about human nature and an honest application of it to your own personal life. And that's how we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. The gospel is the same to all, but you know yourself as a human being better than anybody else does. And God has given his word so that we can see ourselves as he sees us. Thus, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now go read the rest of it. And he talks about the man who looks in the mirror, sees himself, exactly what he is he doesn't do a thing about it but we look into the mirror of God's word to see how God sees us and then we're expected to do something about it when we see what needs to be corrected so here's some wonderful sentiments that should challenge us in setting our affections on things above that is on the truth that guides us in this life and it helps us look beyond those things that are still in our life. We don't know how long we'll be on this earth. We don't know what can come upon us, what troubles and trials can be upon us. You just don't know. But we know what's out there in the future, and we know who holds that future. And we know who has promised us that he'll keep us and not forsake us. That's the pick-me-up we have. One of the things, and I'll close on this, one of the things that handicaps us greatly is that everything is working to hold us to the present as if it's always going to be that way. Everything is working to anchor us into the material things, time and space. We make our plans that way. I like what was said to me some years ago. I may have used it here before. I know I have, in fact, but it's been some time. When a young man was asked by his father, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? He said, well, I reckon I'll go to college. That might be some other kind of school besides college, but usually there's something else. Not always. Some kind of training. And then the father said, well, what are you going to do after that? He said, I'll probably try to get married. That's what usually happens. That's not necessary. Some don't, but I probably will. Then the father said, all right. Now, after you've married, what are you going to do? Well, hopefully, have children and raise them. Okay. Now that you've done that, and after that, what are you going to do? Well, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to see our children married and have grandchildren, and we'll continue to work, be useful long as we can be the father said okay but what what about after that well we'll reach some point we have to slow down and hopefully get to a point where we can retire from regular work as we grow older and the father said okay now what about after that and the young man said well i guess at some point i'll die and then the father said okay and what about after that because, you see, no matter how many plans were made that I described along as the Father asked, what are you going to do after this? It all ends up in eternity. And whatever you choose in this life, if it doesn't help you get into heaven, it's not worth it. And thus, the choices that you make will have either blessings are consequences. God wants us to make choices that will give us blessings. So we won't have to suffer consequences. And I can't think of anything better than just what we've quoted most often. Jesus said it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now think of everything the Father said and after this what? And all these things shall be added unto you. If you want to be able to handle the past, the present, and the future 
then you become a Christian, and that becomes the most important thing there is to life. And that's the way you live. Because you're not going to be here forever. In this room, some's going to depart this world quicker than others. And some's going to depart, and they don't even realize they've got a short time ahead of them. Short in comparison to how long others are here. But we keep building, and we keep asking, all right, and what next? Until finally you come to death, and then there's only two places for eternity you're going to be, and that's determined by what you did here in the flesh. That's heaven or hell. And we must be like Joshua and tell everybody, first of all ourselves, choose you this day whom you will serve. But it's for me and my house we'll serve the Lord. And don't let anybody get in your way. Family, friends, work, school, it doesn't make any difference. Let nobody get in your way of going to heaven. You can't. If it does, think about standing before the Lord and saying, but yeah, but I could. I could I, what, what got in his way? What got in the Lord's way? Nothing. And so he laid down his life for you and for me, even while we're yet sinners. And we're the, if we're Christians, members of the spiritual body of Christ, the church. And we have a job to do. is to pick up and keep on seeking and saving the lost as Christ came to do. We're a spiritual body and members in particular. So if we would deal with our lives being faithful to God every day we live, we'll have to learn that God's forgiven us our sins. And that's what we expected when from the heart we obeyed the gospel. Now we must forgive ourselves, not let those things come between us and what we do as we walk the straight and narrow way of truth in our lives, putting God first in thoughts and words and actions, that when we come to the end of our way, we'll know what's next. It's eternal life. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we are going to invite you to become a Christian today. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church that Jesus built and purchased with his blood. If you are a child of God, then you've done that. Are there things in your life hindering you from being closer to God? If so, lay them aside. You're a free moral agent. Put them aside. Don't let them be more important to you than serving God. Because remember, you're going to come to that point to where it will be what next. If you're subject to the blessed invitation of Jesus, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.